Hi, I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. My partner, Kristen Oaks White, will join us a little bit later in the show. $1.69 billion. That's how much damage this summer's drought and excessive heat caused to Louisiana agriculture. That's according to the LSU Ag Center. Economist Dr. Kurt Guidry estimates that about half of the total damage, more than $800 million, occurred on farms where crops performed poorly or died. Wildfires caused more than $71 million in damage to timber stands in the state. Guidry says the drought caused another $250 million in damage through slowed tree growth and replacement of seedlings. The drought and heat also hit the livestock sector hard. Guidry estimates losses due to animal deaths reduced weights and forced liquidation at nearly $390 million in losses. Now, crawfish farmers are already seeing the effects of the drought and heat. The LSU Ag Center estimates the drought affected about 45,000 acres of crawfish ponds, and farmers will be prevented from fishing another 43,000, either because of saltwater intrusion or lack of water. Twyla's Carl Wiggers takes us to crawfish country to show us what farmers are facing there. On his farm in Jennings, Louisiana, Zach Abair is taking stock of what's just beneath the surface of this flooded field, a new crop of crawfish. We're starting to really see some promise and, you know, that there's a, that there's a crop out there, um, uh, maybe a significant one, you know, which would be really good. A lot of people are saying they've seen more crawfish emerge. Now, they're emerging later than normal, which is most likely going to relate to a later than normal season. A start of the season. Yeah, that's, that's very promising right there, actually. Todd Fontenot is an area agent for the LSU Ag Center focusing on crawfish production. He says this year's heat and drought have the industry in uncharted waters. There's just a lot of unknowns this year with those extreme temperatures we had, exactly what that may have done for to reproduction, first of all, and, and their survival. Our biggest concern was that with that heat and the dryness, you know, we were going to start losing crawfish in the ground. They were drained for harvest and drained awfully fast, uh, faster than normal because of no rainfall. Went through the harvest with no rainfall and uh, continued into the fall without any rainfall. However, based on what he's pulling from the water, Abair is breathing a little easier. That's because farmers like Abair put a lot of money into this crop so we can enjoy crawfish on our tables. It's already been extremely expensive this year and it gets really expensive really fast. Bait costs, labor costs, everything goes up every year. However, further south, thousands of acres of crawfish ponds remain dry because of high salinity levels in surface water. Any waterways that were associated with the intercoastal canal had increased salinity. And um, we, we finding um, levels higher than a lot of people have ever talked about. Those fields that are normally full of water, just like this, ready to crawfish in January, are bone dry. I mean, there's, there's no water and they're not going to pump, they're not going to take the deep water, they have nothing to do. So I, I just, I don't see how we're not going to see a significant drop in, vo in volume industry-wide. In Jennings, Louisiana, I'm Carl Wiggers for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. In monetary terms, the LSU Ag Center estimates the damage to Louisiana's crawfish industry at nearly $140 million. It's the season of giving, and the Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee is leading the way. The group recently completed a series of visits to veterans' homes across the state. State and parish groups raised funds and collected items for donation to these homes. In total, the Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee raised more than $7,000 plus baskets of food, clothing, and other necessary items. Women's Leadership Committee members said it was their small way of saying thanks to the men and women who gave a lifetime of service. We're in Jennings today and we're glad to be here just to interact with our veterans and show them that we truly appreciate their support uh, for our country and all they have done in the past years. Uh, we're playing bingo today and have made a monetary donation to them. We were very fortunate that we had a good turnout and we were able to purchase a lot of um, necessities for the veterans home. 
The Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee has events like this throughout the year. To learn more about these and stay up to date, head over to our website at twilatv.org. If you're looking for a rice and easy dinner idea, see what I did there, one that's locally produced, you'll soon have another option. A local brand of parboiled rice will soon be on the grocery store shelves. This week, Twyla Cecily Oliver shows us how Supreme Rice Mills in Crowley plans to expand. Supreme Rice Mill will have a new production line starting soon. The meal, headquartered in Crowley, Louisiana, is investing $16.2 million to become the fourth parboil rice facility in the U.S. and the first ever in the state of Louisiana. Supreme's Vice President of Operations, Danny Nuger, explains why they decided to expand into new markets. Uh, our domestic markets uh, who buy a lot of our milled rice um, but they, they can't take a whole truckload of just milled rice. So they're asking what other varieties we may have that they could fill a truck to help them with freight. And one big uh, demand was parboil. A lot of the, the, the customers were asking, well, if you have parboil rice, we'd love to you know, load up a truck with half and half or something like that. So there's a big demand for it is what it is. Many of you may be wondering what parboil rice is. Parboil rice is a partially cooked rice with a high nutritional value. One of the interesting things about the rice is the way it is milled. Unlike white rice, parboil rice is taken directly from the farm with the husk still on it, then boiled to a temperature of 160 degrees like this, but on a much larger scale, in tanks this size. The rice is then dried back down to a normal moisture level to be milled and packaged. Supreme's rice expansion will not only benefit Louisiana consumers who are looking for a local parboil variety, but the state's farmers too. It, it definitely, there'll be some uh, value added to the rice uh, because it's a different variety. It gives us more uh, markets to, to uh, market into, which obviously trickles down to the local farmers. Supreme is hoping to have the new facility completed by March and to be producing the new product by April of 2024. I am Cecily Oliver for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. If you would like to learn more about Supreme Rice Mills expansion, visit our website at twilatv.org. The holiday season is a time of joy for cultures around the world. However, it can also be a dark time, figuratively and literally. That's why it's important to take care of your mental health and talk with your loved ones. This week, Twila's Neil Malasson shows us there are resources out there for anyone struggling. In Tangipahoe Parish, Coy and Katie Corkin are pulling up to do their farm chores. The couple raise cattle here near Ameet, and like most farmers in their area, they had trouble with this season's drought and heat, selling off most of their herd this summer. The drought, it, it made it to where the grass, you know, was completely done, and we had to buy more feed to feed our cattle. Um, water was an issue, like watering the cows. Um, as well as growing crops um, that we normally would. So it's been a real burden, um, not only on us, but for everybody in the community. Both Coy and Katie have off-farm jobs. He's a state trooper while she is the executive director of the Louisiana Rural Mental Health Alliance. Katie says while the jobs provide them with financial stability, many in rural Louisiana are dependent upon a single source of income. She says on-farm stress has taken its toll this year as a result. In town at the local sale barn, there was cars, trucks with trailers of cows for miles because people were having to sell off their cows. And that was truly impactful and devastating because this is a way of life for people out here and that really hit home um, and it just it was really sad. Katie knows all too well how difficult it can be to talk about mental health issues. She says her personal struggles have helped to give her insight into what people go through. Having depression and anxiety, um, I never knew that that's what that was until you know I was diagnosed because you often don't realize what these feelings are and why they are persisting. And so here on the, the farm life, you know, worrying about the weather, worrying about financial stressors and the, the debt load that farmers and ranchers often face, that, that's a heavy mental load that many people don't give significance to. That's why she spends her time in Baton Rouge advocating for better policies and laws related to mental health. One of the biggest issues that we're working on is uh, for Medicaid patients 
Um, they have up to seven options for a Medicaid plan, and providers don't want to have to deal with seven different plans because they each have their own rules and policies, and so that's an extreme burden that most small providers in rural areas, they can't take on that load, which means they can't see more patients, and the same obviously goes with private insured as well. Winter can be a tough time for those struggling with mental health, even without disasters. Katie says the most important thing people can do is reach out and connect with others. I do believe that the stigma is lifting around mental illness and mental health issues because people are starting to talk about it. I know I talk about my um, issues with depression and anxiety because I want others to know you're not alone. Like even though I might smile and look like a person that doesn't have something, you never know what somebody's experiencing on the inside. And so the more we talk about it and the more we tell our stories, that gives people the chance to tell their story and to know that they're not alone. If you or anyone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, dial 988. Even if you think it's not serious, there are people willing to talk. We'll also have a link to our website to the Louisiana Rural Mental Health Alliance on our website at twilighttv.org. And Avery, I know this is not something we bring up very often on this mm -hmm. show, but um, we are going to post an extra on our website about um, Katie giving some tips about what to look for in yourself and others as far as when people are ex experiencing mental health difficulties. And one of the things she talked about was actually asking people, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about committing suicide? And that's been a taboo thing, I know, I know growing up and in many areas, but that's fortunately changing and some of the stigma is being removed from it. And I know with this being a difficult year for our farmers and ranchers with the drought and everything, this is de definitely necessary information. And the Louisiana Farm Bureau and American Farm Bureau have mental health pages on their website, so you want to check that out. Thank you very much, Neil Malasson. Still to come on Twyla, holiday cooking is a family affair, and Kristen Oaks White brings in family to share a few holiday recipes. Feasting on Agriculture is next. Stay with us. Welcome to a very special edition of Feasting on Agriculture. This month we're home for the holidays, my home in fact, and we're cooking up a few of my favorite holiday dishes with a special guest chef, my mom. Feasting on Agriculture is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, Louisiana Crawfish, Ask Before You Eat, and by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, Beef, It's What's For Dinner, and by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board, Think Rice. The holidays are here and it's a time when many families not only gather around the dinner table but also in the kitchen to prepare meals for their celebrations and some of my fondest memories revolve around the kitchen helping my mom prepare and learn how to prepare dishes for our celebrations and my mom's here today with us Becky Oaks and she is one of the best cooks that I know and 99% of everything that I know about cooking especially baking I learned from you so where did you learn to cook and where did that love of cooking where was that fostered? Well, my love of cooking came from my mother too. And my job at home was basically to do the pies mm -hmm. and to do the sweets. And so when Christmas comes, we started cooking and we cooked for months it seemed like, <laughs> but it wasn't that long. But we cooked candy and uh, cookies and cakes and all sorts of things. So it really does make Christmas when you cook. Special, yeah. Well, we're gonna share some of those recipes today because you've got some, some staple holiday dishes in my mind. But first, I feel like I'm gonna give something since you've taught me so much about cooking. I'm gonna teach you a dish that I found last year and I prepared it for our Christmas celebration and it's a cheesecake, but it's not a cheesecake dessert. It's a cheesecake appetizer, okay. a crawfish cheesecake. I'm gonna recruit you okay. to what help me. So we're gonna start out. The first thing that we need to do is we need a sleeve of Ritz crackers. Okay. So we just want them crushed okay. finely. All right. As fine as we can get them. Here, I'll help you. I can just okay. Maybe I you am. You do that. <laughs> so once we've got our Ritz crackers crushed, we're gonna add half a cup of Parmesan cheese. So make this other way. We'll just sh shake that up. And we're gonna add this to the bottom of a spring-loaded pan. Then we add with half a stick of melted butter. Stir this up. We're 
pressing it in. Now this part is done. So from here, we need three strips of bacon. We're gonna saute three strips of bacon, remove the bacon, and then cook our onions in the bacon grease. Okay. So now we're moving on to the cheesecake, I guess, part of the recipe. We've got three eight ounce packages of cream cheese and you wanna have them at room temperature. We've got two in the mixer already. You can use a hand mixer if you don't have a stand mixer. To me, it's just always easier to use the KitchenAid mixer. Then we're gonna add one cup of heavy cream. So the next thing we're gonna do is add three eggs. And these are three eggs for my chicken coop. Okay. <laughs> now we're gonna add two cups of shredded Swiss cheese. Now we're going to add our sauteed onions. We also need to crumble the bacon. Now we're adding the star of the show, crawfish tails. So we've got 12 ounces. Drain, we drain the package first, and we're gonna fold this in. Okay, now is where that I looks good. really need your help. Okay. Because. Your ball doesn't have a handle on it. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it does not. So you hold the bowl. Okay. And I'll scoop. I'm not gonna spill it. Oh, I'm not. Yet. <laughs> not too worried. Time to bake in the oven. You want me to open it for you? We've got it at 375, and it will stay in here for 40 minutes until it's golden brown at the top. Through the magic of TV, ta-da, we have our final product ready. You can serve it with crackers, Ritz crackers, like we made the crust with. Um, we have water crackers. You can also take French bread, slice it. If you can really adventure, slice it up, bake it, have some crispy rounds. Um, great thing to bring to any party. When we come back from the break, now it's mom's turn to take the lead and she's gonna do her pecan pie. Okay. Stay with us. Now for the real cooking lesson time because you're an educator, a principal, a teacher, but you really shine as a baking superstar. So oh, now it's that. your turn to teach me, and this, this is your most famous dish to me because it's not the holidays without a pecan pie. So well, teach me your ways. <laughs> well, it's, an, it's really an easy dish to do, but I've tried many different recipes, and my favorite recipe is the one from Cotton Country Cookbook. And it says it's the best pecan pie, and it is, because uh, for different reasons. I don't like to make a pecan pie with whole pecans. I like, to, or even half pecans. I like it with the pieces. And I like a pecan pie that's not too sweet, because when it's really, really sweet, it's hard to eat. Okay. So the first thing you need to do in this pecan pie recipe is kind of prioritize. And the first thing we're gonna do is to melt to melt our butter here. And so this has been melted, it's waiting to go into the pie. So it has three eggs in it. Now you whisk these up. The next thing you put in are your sugars. There's one cup of granulated sugar. Of course, this is good Louisiana cane sugar, we hope. That's very true, yes. Yeah. And the next thing that we're going to put in is Cairo syrup, white clear Cairo syrup, not the, I don't like the uh, dark kind because it makes it a little strong and I think this gives it a better flavor. So we're gonna, there you go. Mix this up pretty good. Just half a teaspoon of lemon juice. And so that cuts some of that sweetness right there. A pinch of salt, just a little pinch, just not very much at all and then a teaspoonful of vanilla flavoring. After that, you can put in a cup of chopped pecans, 
I like the chopped pecans because... I, I will say this, this is what makes to me your pecan pie so different because you just don't see many. Most of them use whole pecans. And I don't know, I don't know that it necessarily affects the taste, but I just have always liked this pie because it's chopped pecans. Yep, that's the reason I like it too. And the recipe calls for chopped pecans too. I, like I probably get... would never have used it like that until I'd read that recipe. And the next thing you're going to do is take your butter and pour the butter, melted butter in. Now, isn't this a big part? I've heard you, when people ask why, how do you make your pecan pie? This is a big part of this recipe, right? Oh yes. The brown butter. Right. We're gonna pour it into an unbaked pie shell. You just pour it in to the okay. unbaked crust. And then you put it in the oven. See, really quick. Okay. The, the way it's cooked is really important. 10 minutes at 425, then you turn the temperature back to 350 for 40 minutes. And pretty much it's definitely gonna be ready. Even though it might jiggle a little in here, you take it out and it's good, it sets up and it's ready to go. I don't like a pecan pie that's cooked too much. Well, we've got a visitor now that, I see that. really wants to, <laughs> to taste this. So give him a spoon, this is Teddy who's ready to taste some of this pecan pie. Teddy, say hello to Dwyla. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> well, if you want this recipe and some of our other favorites that I'm gonna put on a blog post, including the cheesecake, we put a link on our website at twilatv.org. So we hope you all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. Say bye-bye, Teddy. Say bye-bye. See you next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Feasting on Agriculture was brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, Louisiana Crawfish, Ask Before You Eat, and by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, Beef, It's What's for Dinner, and by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board, Think Rice. It's always good to see Becky on the show. Well, we're going to keep the Christmas spirit going with today's Twyla Boost. Our friends at John Deere celebrate the women in agriculture and show how a little encouragement can be the best gift of all with this special holiday commercial. All right. <sighs> Thank you. I love it. You're I welcome. need a new one. Your turn, Yeah. Oh. What do you think? <laughs> oh, it looks great. Mm -hmm. Oh, Merry Christmas. Nice. Hey. You know, I was thinking this will look better on you. <laughs> Let's try this. Always take the hat, leave the tiara. That does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll take a walk down memory lane and bring you the biggest and best stories of 2023. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twilatv.org. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find all of these stories and more on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe, turn on those notifications so you know when we put something new out there. For all of us here at Twyla, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.